I've got a very serious message, but I've lost a piece of paper that it's written on, which is uh, somebody has a Peugeot, which is placed, uh, parked in the wrong place, a Peugeot 206. I had got the registration number written on a piece of paper, but I, I need to tell the owner of that car that if you ever want to see it again, you have to move it. Uh, Leon's was talking about transport. This is a point about transport and about sequencing. Whoever has the Peugeot, which is parked in the wrong place, please move it, uh, or you may never see it again. It may be pulped or left on the edge of the city uh, in some pound. So this is your opportunity. Uh, and if anybody finds a piece of paper again, uh, please give it to me. This is going to preoccupy me entirely for the next session. My name is Roger Williamson. You can see that uh, I've already failed the uh, test as a well-organized chairperson. Uh, but, uh, fortunately, we're going to be redeemed by a very talented and very well-informed uh, panel. Uh, one constantly learns interesting and new things in uh, sessions on gender and development. I used to organize conferences for uh, Wilton Park, the government uh, conference center in the UK, and one of the best contributions on women's empowerment that I heard was from uh, a Somali businesswoman who said, uh, in one of our sessions, when people start talking about women's empowerment, they always start talking about microfinance. I'm not interested in microfinance. I want some real money. So with that level of ambition, uh, I think we have uh, uh, some insights into what can be done, not setting artificial limits or ceilings. The first speaker is um, Jenny McGill. Uh, and she's going to be talking about um, Asian drivers. Jenny, if you could come up. Um, quite clearly, the um, Asian donors is a, is a vital uh, aspect of this. You can see I've got new glasses. I said Asian drivers, not Asian donors. But it is actually Asian donors, so don't worry, Jenny. Uh, your topic is as advertised. Uh, and clearly, this uh, represents... Um, a part of the world with a huge percentage of uh, human population. So it could not be more important. The technology is working. The speaker looks poised and is giving me uh, affirmative nods. The floor is yours. Thanks, Roger. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Wider um, and Karen Grohn um, and the donors um, of the RECOM program for uh, supporting my paper and also including me in this conference. I'm really delighted to be here and to learn so much from the other participants. Um, I'm especially delighted to be on this panel um, with uh, Roger, Joel, and Nalima, and also was very excited to see that the partner country representatives who are gonna be speaking after lunch are all from the Asia region. Um, I'm selfishly very pleased about that and I really look forward to their, um, their reflections and, and um, contributions. Uh, so, uh, I'd like to first give you a, an overview of, of um, what I was attempting to do through my paper and then highlight some of the key findings and some of my reflections on some of the findings. And the detail um, is in the paper, including an annex where I try to summarize as much as I um, could um, synthesize about the, the Asian donors that I was, I was focusing on. So my intention was to try to complement some of the other recom studies, particularly Joelle's, which was looking at the, um, the Nordic donors, by taking a look at the major, a major Asian donors um, and their um, efforts to um, promote gender equality through their work. Um, but in the process, I also found an interesting case study in the Philippines. And I thought it might be interesting to also look at the Philippine um, harmonized um, gender development guidelines that the Asian donors as well as other donors have been, um, have been um, supporting and now trying to report under um, as an interesting example of um, harmonization being driven by, um, by a, um, um, the country, um, the developing country, in collaboration with donors. Um, that also gave me an opportunity to look at what these Asian donors were actually doing on the ground in a specific country to contrast that with what their commitments were. Um, I was, however, only looking at uh, traditional Asian donors. I was unfortunately not able to look at the interesting South-South cooperation work of 
some of the major Asian countries such as China and India. Um, I also wasn't able to look at the gender equality work of non-Asian donors such as Danita or Sida in Asia. Um, and uh, so with that, let me tell you a little bit more about, um, about the work. I was first asked, uh, because I'm the first on this panel, to say a couple of, um, well, let's see, I think I'll skip the methodology, the gender mainstreaming, okay. Um, so um, I was um, asked to say a couple of general words about gender mainstreaming just to frame the discussion in this panel, but I think Karen Grohn also highlighted some of the the broad issues around gender mainstreaming. Maybe I'll just flag a couple of things that I think are particularly relevant to the, the uh, donors I was looking at. One is that although we often associate gender mainstreaming with the ECOSOC um, resolution uh, that was passed in um, 1997 following on the Beijing conference and this notion of um, assessing the implications for women and men of any planning, uh, of any planned action so that women and men benefit equally and inequality is not perpetuated, in fact, when we look at where gender mainstreaming comes from, it really comes from uh, an accumulation of experiments and practices um, by a number of countries, including donor countries in particular. And, um, and there, I think Australia and New Zealand all stand out as countries that were experimenting with uh, different forms of national women's machineries, um, gender auditing procedures, gender budgeting, as well as the Philippines, which was at the forefront of much of the, of the early work on gender mainstreaming and gender budgeting in particular. Um, so it's, I think it's good to look at this gender mainstream experience as really an accumulation of experience over time that is still very much ongoing. Um, and I think as, as Karen noted, uh, one of the common approaches to gender mainstreaming to try to implement this is through a two-track or a twin-track approach, and I certainly found that in the work of the Asian donors. Um, also, the, um, the various reviews and, um, and evaluations of the experience of gender mainstreaming um, of individual donors or um, of donors, governments, and NGOs in general have highlighted um, pretty consistently some key factors that are considered to be key ingredients for successful uh, promotion of gender equality. And I clustered these around five themes for uh, my own analysis of the, uh, of the Asian donors. One was looking at um, strong leadership, expertise, and accountability to the extent to which that um, was in place. Uh, another was the implementation of various effective well, procedures and practices to try to integrate a gender perspective and gender equality concerns across um, uh, different forms of development assistance. The third was different capacity building measures, both for staff and development partners around gender equality. Uh, fourth, uh, adequate financial resources, which Karen mentioned, and then timely monitoring, evaluation, and learning. And so I'll now just touch on a few of uh, my findings around at least four of these common themes. Uh, but to first say a, a, a word about the, the donors I was looking at, um, as you'll see, it's a fairly interesting and heterogeneous group. And it gave me an opportunity to draw some interesting comparisons and contrasts. Um, I was looking at um, a regional development bank, ADB, as well as four OEC DAC um, donor countries. Um, so what we ha I had was um, a mix of both bilateral donors and a development bank, both old and new OEC DAC members, with um, COICA being the newest, Korea and COICA being the newest. Um, uh, Asian donors that were um, located both in East Asia and the Pacific, and donors using different mixes of aid modalities, including technical assistance, grants, and, and loans. I think it's also worth noting that three of the bilateral donors have recently undergone major restructuring, and the, the, the one that's most current is AusAIDS, um, current merger into the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and I think this um, highlights one, uh, one issue that I'll uh, come back to at the end about the, the, the challenge of, of trying to consistently promote gender equality through uh, periods of organizational change and political change in particular. And I think here I would also say that um, my observations in Asia are very consistent with what Kai was discussing, which it, you know, had to do with the importance of a history of, of domestic support for gender equality, and the influence that has over uh, an, or a, a country's uh, um, uh, development assistance program. Um, we see that in the strong 
performance, um, certainly until recent dates, of, of both Australia and New Zealand, um, not surprising given their long histories of commitment to gender equality. Um, also, the importance of which party is in power, um, uh, the restructuring of um, New Zealand aid and now currently Australian aid are under conservative governments, um, which appear to be trying to roll back um, some of the, um, certainly some of, some of the development policies that had been in place under previous um, labor governments. Um, so looking at, oh, let's see, I think I'll skip over this, to the policy commitments of the, of the Asian donors, I think it's interesting to see that um, all but one now has a standalone gender equality policy. Um, New Zealand, um, under the current government, had um, basically replaced their gender equality policy with a more um, general commitment to um, seeing gender as one of several cross-cutting themes. Um, and all of the gender equality policies in place, as Karen was mentioning, um, reflect of support for both normative and instrumental um, arguments for promoting gender equality, and they all reflect, to some extent, this two-track approach that, that Karen mentioned. Uh, in terms of gender equality leadership, uh, I think it's important to note that the Asian donors uh, like, um, I think, um, development organizations elsewhere have experienced fairly mixed um, uh, periods of political leadership um, on gender equality, um, weak or sporadic um, experiences. But I'd note that um, at least in uh, the cases of AusAid and until recently and um, Asian Development Bank, there has been some um, recent improvement. Uh, in AusAid until the recent merger with um, uh, the Department of, uh, of Foreign Affairs and Trade, um, there was a global ambassador um, for women and girls uh, representing um, Australia and also a gender advocate, a strong high-level gender advocate or two, several um, in, the, um, in the management of AusAid. And both ADB and AusAid senior gender advisors have recently been participating in more management-level decision-making, management-level committees, which has certainly um, had a positive support, a positive um, impact on um, the, the leverage they're able to, to exert. In terms of gender expertise in the organizations, there's, there's definitely a commitment across all the organizations to having some number of um, dedicated gender experts, but there's quite a lot of variation even now in the numbers in place. Right now, in Koika and in New Zealand, uh, there are only one, there's only one um, dedicated gender um, specialist in place to oversee and coordinate all of the, um, of the gender equality work of the organization. The other um, organizations all have much larger teams in place. Um, but there are different numbers um, um, and different allocations of, of um, gender experts um, between, say, centrally, lo centrally um, located teams and then gender experts um, um, distributed through either other departments at headquarters or in the country offices. Um, I would also note that the different um, donors um, see different roles played by some of the gender experts in other parts of the organization. All of the donors um, all uh, recognize a critical role that the central gender experts play, but AusAid um, also relies heavily on a jet, or had been re relying heavily on a, um, a gender focal point network. Um, ADB had been, rel been relying heavily and still is on um, a strong cadre of national gender specialists working in its resident missions to um, really localize, contextualize its, its commitments in its, in its um, loan projects. In terms of accountability, all of the organizations have a mix of internal and external accountability mechanisms in place. Um, on the internal side, all but New Zealand has um, a, a gender equality action plan um, that is driving, at a corporate level, driving um, the organization's commitment to gender equality with a variety of, um, of goals or targets. Um, ADB, um, uh, among all of them, has perhaps gone the farthest in um, making commitments in terms of hard targets for gender mainstreaming um, in its um, loan operations. Um, at the moment, um, it has committed, and this is in its, um, um, its, its publicly available um, annual report on its development effectiveness to mainstream um, gender equality, um, very specifically defined um, in for at least 45% of all of its loan projects. 
Um, in, ter in terms of external accountability, I found it interesting that all but New Zealand have some form of external gender forum, uh, council, committee um, that meets periodically with the management and with staff to review the progress that the agency has made and to make recommendations for improving um, the organization's performance on gender equality. And um, in Japan, there's a, 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 very, a very feisty parliamentary caucus that also um, scrutinizes the, um, the gender responsiveness of, of Japanese ODA. It seems to me from my observation um, that all of these external um, advisory groups do play an important role in keeping gender equality on the agenda of the organizations, especially through periods of, um, of change, of restructuring, introduction of new business processes, or political change. In terms of process, all of the organizations, as you might expect, have some mix of process requirements to try to um, mainstream gender equality um, through the organization's um, operations. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail, there's more in my paper, but I'll just highlight a couple of points. In terms of engendering country strategies, ADB is um, the one of the donors I looked at that actually requires a country gender strategy to be in place to accompany every new or um, updated country um, program. Uh, in terms of design, I just highlight some of the work of, of ADB and AusAid. AusAid um, is, has introduced and, and hopefully will continue, uh, even in the reorganization, a quality at entry reporting system that, that requires some explanation of what the commitment of the new initiative is to gender equality. Um, whereas ADB, through these gender targets um, and a requirement that um, all projects um, that meet this target have a very specific gender action plan um, that, also, that includes um, specific strategies and targets, gender analysis, um, sex aggregated data for monitoring purposes, um, is also trying to put some meat on the concept of, of um, gender integration in project design. But all of the um, all of the organizations I looked at acknowledge that they're really falling down on implementation, and I think this is a theme that will probably come out um, in, um, in other um, discussions today. Um, in this area, I again would point to what AusAid and ADB have been trying to do to address this as just a couple of examples. AusAid um, has a gender equality and implementation requirement um, for all major projects. Um, so um, on an annual basis, um, project um, uh, leaders have to be reporting on the extent to which the project is actually contributing to gender e equality in the country um, through its implementation. ADB now has uh, recently adopted a target not just on the design of projects but also on um, the achievement of intended gender equality results in completed projects, and that is driving um, a number of changes in the way ADB conducts reviews, um, uh, the way completion reports on projects are, are carried out, and certainly the way evaluations of projects are carried out. In terms of training and capacity development, um, as you might expect, the organizations all have a, a variety of um, approaches to trying to uh, mainstream an understanding of gender uh, issues um, and to provide more specific training on gender equality and gender integration to their staffs. Um, on internal issues, I'll just flag some of the work that AusAid had been doing that, again, one would hope will continue through the reorganization. One was the development of e-learning tools to try to reach a broader number of staff, including um, staff and consultants and um, um, and, and other partners um, that might be, you know, located um, out of Australia um, and less accessible to, um, to um, trainings that were being offered there. Um, also, I found quite interesting that through the um, a general work um, process review, um, the AUSA gender specialists were looking to expand the range of career streams for people interested in promoting gender equality through their work. Um, so that at one level there would be, you know, continual training, capacity development for gender experts, but there would also be another track um, to help um, project managers, um, people working at an operational level who didn't see themselves as gender experts, nonetheless have a stronger grounding in um, gender analysis and understanding of what, what were appropriate um, and effective ways to achieve gender equality through their work, as well as a more general gender awareness program for all staff. On the external side, I would just uh, flag um, some, um, some work that ADB has done 
to try to reach out to um, project managers, and in this case, because ADB is making loans um, to, um, to governments, the project managers are government um, officials, um, to try to um, encourage and promote uh, gender champions who are project managers, especially in uh, more challenging sectors, infrastructure sectors in particular. So what ADB has been um, supporting over several years now are annual peer learning workshops that bring together the project managers uh, from a sector, say water supply and sanitation, from several um, countries to share their experiences, what's worked, what hasn't. And that has had a nice catalytic effect. A number of these um, gender champions who are um, managing ADB-funded projects have done follow-up um, um, experience um, sharing uh, with um, colleagues in, in other ministries and in other countries. I think I'll skip uh, financial resources, talk a little bit about um, evaluations um, and learning. Um, since these are points that, that Karen also raised at the outset. Um, I can see in the experience of the Asian donors a greater um, attention to the need to uh, do more rigorous evaluation. There were a number of evaluations, in fact, of gender equality programs underway at the time I was um, interviewing um, gender advisors and collecting information, um, but also the need for more rapid, informal types of monitoring and um, cross-checking. And here I would just flag the the gender program stock takes that AusAid um, has been conducting, as well as rapid gender assessments that um, ADB had been conducting of selected projects. Um, and this suggests that there's a need for a mix of monitoring and evaluation um, activities to try to keep um, gender equality work on track and try to learn lessons that can be incorporated um, and, and improve um, programming going forward. In the area of research, I would also just flag the uh, what I found very interesting and impressive work that AusAid had been doing to try to um, incorporate um, the results of research in its gender equality programming, um, linking with um, research institutes and universities and commissioning um, specific um, research projects. Um, this was particularly influential in AusAid's work on um, violence against women in the Pacific, and as a result of AusAid's support, along with other um, uh, development agencies and partners of, of a number of um, prevalence surveys in Asia and the Pacific, and specifically the Pacific, AusAid was able to make um, a commitment um, and um, was actually forced because of the results of these evaluations to take action, develop an action plan, and, and major, make a large funding commitment to, um, to uh, fight violence against women in the Pacific and more broadly in Asia. And we will have to see with the pending aid cuts in Australia the extent to which those commitments um, um, survive. Um, hopefully they will. Um, I think I'll just say a few words about um, the, um, these harmonized, yes, yes, the harmonized GAD guidelines in the Philippines. Um, there's more detail in my paper, um, but I think this is a really interesting example of an attempt um, uh, to collaborate involving the uh, Philippine Commission on Women, ANETA, the National Economic and Planning Authority, and the donor network um, on uh, gender and development in the Philippines to try to develop some common principles for integrating gender equality in their uh, programs and then a scoring system that's linked to those principles um, that then gives rise to an annual reporting system um, both by the donors and by um, key government agencies. I did find that Australia and New Zealand were the donors I was looking at that seemed to be making the most effective use of these guidelines. And um, I think there's room for greater use by other donors in, in, um, in the Philippines and perhaps other ways that these um, guidelines could uh, act as a model for, it, for similar um, um, initiatives elsewhere. And I'll be happy to talk more about that uh, later. Um, so generally, I, I found through this, this quick review of the work of several East Asian donors a number of challenges that I think are shared by other donors. One is the challenge of trying to maintain um, um, a focus on gender equality through um, dramatic political change and organizational restructurings. Um, another was the challenge of trying to um, address gender equality issues through a very heavily economic focused um, um, aid program, especially loan projects. But here, uh, I think ADB's experience and experience in, in more effectively mainstreaming gender equality in its economic development projects, especially in, in infrastructure projects, in, provides some lessons for some of the bilateral donors, such as Japan and Korea, that have really not been doing much in this area so far. Um, 
And I think I've already flagged what I consider some of the interesting um, experiments and innovations that might be of interest to donors elsewhere, um, including research, um, the greater use of research to inform programming um, by AusAid, um, harnessing of, of results um, based management approaches by ADB through um, setting very specific targets with very specific definitions um, on gender mainstreaming and specific processes for, for making that happen. And then this harmonization um, experiment in the Philippines that I think does merit greater attention and, and um, perhaps um, application elsewhere. And I think with that, I may leave the, uh, the policy implications, Roger, because I'm sure those will come up in, uh, in discussion later. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to ask uh, Joel to come up to the uh, podium, please. And um, Finn has now magically uh, found the piece of paper with the person about the car. The Peugeot 206 XD47636, XD47636, must be moved. Uh, I'm sorry about that, to lower the tone after such a wonderful presentation and before another one. Do you want to resume here or no. sit here? I don't mind. Yeah. Right. Um, Joel is the next uh, presenter. Joel Malokeli Nanivatso. Um, she's been threatening to cut her presentation short, but I give uh, instructions not to, in spite of the time pressure we're under. Uh, and Joel has done a fantastic job in putting, pulling things together uh, for this event and also uh, working on the project, um, the RECOM uh, project on this subject uh, as the gender specialist uh, on um, the RECOM staff, the wider staff. I'd also remind you, uh, Jenny made reference to it, the presentations are on the memory stick and so this is a wonderful thing to uh, take home and use. Uh, it's a fantastic innovation. I won't take any more time. Joel, please use your time to the full. Yes, thank, uh, thank you, Rogers. And, and I would like first to thank you all for, uh, for, for coming to, to, uh, to, to this meeting. And also thank Karen for, for joining our, our, our team at, at, at UniWide. My, uh, my, uh, my paper is uh, gender men, men, men's, mainstreaming in, in the Nordic country, which is co-author uh, with Lucy, uh, Lucy Scott of uh, Overseas Dev, 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 Development as an as Institute. The, uh, the, overall, uh, the overall goal of, of, of this paper was to assess the gender men, mainstreaming effort of three Nor uh, Nordic uh, uh, agencies that, uh, that needed the Finnish uh, M, uh, MFA and SIDA. What, what we have tried to do, which is dif uh, different of most gender men, uh, men, uh, men, mainstreaming analysis, is to look at both the headquarter level as well as the, uh, the, uh, the embassy level. Because we, we, uh, we, we found out that gender men, uh, mainstreaming is not only about the process, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the internal re uh, reorganization of, uh, of an agency, is more about the outcome. And where you, you find the outcome is through in, 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 in interventions. And most, uh, most interventions are design, uh, uh, conceive, design, uh, 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 implemented at, 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 the, at the embassy level, and that has been for, uh, forgotten. So we have tried to uh, do that. And why just those three uh, uh, Nor uh, Nor uh, Nordic agencies? Because they are considered as being pioneer in, 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 in gender equality through, uh, through, through the work of uh, 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 Esther Bosserap, the feminist nov um, nov um, nov movement, as well as some high level uh, uh, participation at uh, uh, the UN uh, uh, conf uh, conf uh, conf uh, conferences uh, for gender equality. So I, I, will, I, I will not talk about gender men, 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 men streaming because Jenny has already mentioned that. I, 
I will go through my uh, the, the, the logic that we have uh, 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 adopted for this paper. And our, our result for uh, we have uh, looked at six aspects of, of gender mainstreaming, but here for, uh, for, uh, for the sake of time, I will only look at few, I think two, two, two or two or two or three two or three of them, you are, you are, you are welcome to the, and, and read the, the, and the paper. And then in, 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 in this section with a funny title, we have tried to, to look at past, past evaluation, see, to what, uh, see what, what was the issue was for in, in, in the past evaluation and then ask the gender advisor how, how they have resolved those uh, issues or, or if those issues are still persistent or what, uh, what are they thinking about to, uh, to, do, to, to, to solve some of those I I issues. And then I will go to uh, policy implication and then some con uh, concluding remark. So we have op uh, opted for a semi-structure in, 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 in interviews with two gender advisors in, in, in each of those uh, Nordic uh, 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 agencies, as well as reviewing some gender men, uh, mainstreaming li li literature and some policy do, uh, documents. So we, we, we came up with a questionnaire, which is available, uh, basically uh, divided in, 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 in three parts. The in, 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 in internal organization, the ex, uh, ex, ex, external pro, um, operational pro, 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 uh, procedure, as well as the project evaluation. So what, what, what we did for, uh, for, uh, for the last uh, co 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 uh, component of the questionnaire, we asked the gender advisor to send the questionnaire to one uh, focal point in one of the uh, the, uh, the the embassy, and we left. Uh, we uh, we will uh, we will we will we we'll let them decide which of the country should also the questionnaire, and 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 also to also pick the the uh, the projects that they uh, they, uh, they will like to to answer those questions. So that's that's what we did. So in terms of commitment, that is not even, uh, it, it's a fact that the street countries, they are highly committed to gender equality. And that is trans, uh, trans, translated in terms of, of gender equality being a, a priority area or a cross-cutting issue. And that's what we, we found out that in, uh, in, in, in the longest uh, history, they have switched those uh, gender equality, either being a gender uh, a, 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 a priority area or a, a, a cross-cutting issue. Why they, uh, they, uh, they switch, uh, it, it was really uncertain why was the motivation for uh, 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 switching from one or the, uh, the, uh, the other. And that has been trans, uh, trans, translated in, uh, in, in the two, uh, two, uh, two track uh, approaches, both uh, uh, men, uh, men, 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 streaming gender equality in, 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 in their operation, as well as in a stra a stra a strategic and, and, and targeted a, 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 a intervention. But in, in, the, uh, in the last decade or so, they started moving through uh, to, 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 uh, to a right-based approach. And most of the gender advisors have actually admitted that they are still grappling with what is a, a, a right-based approach, particularly in, in terms of, 
uh, results or in implementation on, 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 on the ground because gender equality has a much broader con 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 context than just uh, the uh, what, what, uh, the rights based a a a approach. And that also has uh, um, made them look at gender equality as a human right. And with, with that also came uh, a strong focus on the, the soft sec, uh, sec, uh, sector, for instance, health, e e education, and water, not, 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 not really in, in, in terms of agriculture infra, infra, and, and infrastructure and economic um, as, um, and pro productive sec, uh, sec, sector. So looking at the budget that, uh, at their budget for gender e equality using party or nail gender policy ma uh, maker, we see that gender is a well-funded, um, I mean, if you ignore all of the, the issue, it, 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 but the, how they come up with this, um, uh, this, uh, this uh, value, you can see at, at first value, gender is pretty well funded. But that does, 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 does not say anything about, uh, about the quality of the program. Where, does, where, where do those, those, those money go? And what is the progress accomplished with this money? And, and also, you also need to make a, a a difference between a, spe a, a budget for special intervention a, a, as well as for integrating gender in, in, into uh, uh, programs. And none of the the uh, the 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 the, the nor a nor a nor Nordic agency have uh, looked at uh, have a budget for gender men, uh, men, 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 per se. So we ask them the question, what is the so, a solution in or, or, order for, for us to really relate the funding to, uh, to, uh, to the progress? And the answer to and this um, is gender bad, uh, budgeting. That uh, came up from, uh, from our dis uh, dis uh, discussion with the gender advisor. And now, th uh, uh, these are some of the results that we, uh, we, uh, we found. In, in, in terms of human uh, resources, both at the, at the headquarters and also in, uh, in, uh, in, in the embassies, there are diff, uh, diff, uh, different. While the Finnish MFA has only one gender advisor, Danida and Sida have um, a several gender advisors, but they are high, uh, highly dis, uh, decentralized uh, um, uh, agency. And they are referred to either team gender or gender app. And one, uh, one of the difficulties for uh, for uh, man, uh, man, uh, managing this big team of, of, of gender that, that are, are, are also in, uh, in, uh, in the embassy is uh, the timing. How can you, can, uh, can you get everybody in one spot to give training? And that has been a, 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 a concern, particularly for SIDA. For the focal point here, the Finnish MFA doesn't have focal points in 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 the in the in in, in the embassies. What they, they, they do once a, a, a project is identified, they will send the the, uh, the, uh, the project for a gender analysis to uh, to the gender advisor. Where uh, where I see that and uh, and I mean that have focal point in 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 their in their in, in their basis, but they are not gender ex, uh, ex, uh, experts, and they are only uh, they are only uh, supposed to to, uh, to have twenty hours to, to work on 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 gender men men, men streaming, and that's particularly for Dan uh, Danida for Sida. 
um, is, is basically depending on the focal point we're working on on, 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 a, on a particular uh, intervention. But the embassy, they are the one, particularly uh, for the, uh, for the uh, intervention, they are the one that are uh, 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 identify and implement the intervention. But for each of those interventions, there is um, a, uh, the, the gender advisor in the head, head quarter uh, um, do the gender analysis or quality asse uh, uh, assessment to make sure that gender uh, gender concerns are, 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 are included in, in the intervention. And they, for, uh, for, uh, for that, they, uh, they, they have come up with pra uh, pra uh, pra pra practical tools for gender men and, and, and mainstream. But there is still a, 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 lot, uh, a lot of committee, uh, 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 commitment uh, evaporation because in the headquarter, the general advisor are really co 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 committed to include gen uh, gender e equality. But when it goes down to, to, the, uh, to, uh, to the embassy, it, it, it basically depends on, on the focal point skills, com uh, co co commitment, uh, uh, as well as time to make sure that gender co co concerns are. are, are are included in a, in a, in a, in the projects. Uh, in, in, in terms of monitoring and evaluation, um, they are still lacking on 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 on, on that. Many evaluation, uh, many projects are not evalu evaluated, and and wherever they are evaluated. Uh, the, the outcome are not uh, divided in, in, in terms of um, genders as a, as a, as a sensitive indicator or, or, or disaggregated in, in, in terms of sex. So what are the, the past, present, and future of, of, of gender mainstreaming? The issue that holds was is uh, human resources. There is still this issue is very pers uh, persistent. And for the last five, five years, the issue has even been uh, more pro prominent, uh, prominent due to staff uh, cut, uh, cut, uh, cut, uh, cut back uh, for SIDA and um, uh, Danida. And that has made the gender uh, the, 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 the advisor to, to be more generalist than, than spe, uh, specialist. Why? Because now they, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they need to acquire skills that will uh, allow them to move from one sector to the other, or being able to, uh, to, uh, to take on other uh, tasks as, uh, uh, as uh, 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 required. And there is also the issue that is coming up more is the, the, pri the priority overload and, and the priority sw uh, switching. And that the, um, we ask them, uh, we ask them the question, so what, uh, what do you think is the sol uh, solution? Because taking into account the, the dev uh, dev development problem are changing uh, through the decades and the focus of foreign aid is also ch uh, changing with it. What, uh, what do you think is the sol uh, solution to, to pr uh, priority sw uh, switching? And the answer was incentive and com a com a commitment. Basically, there, uh, there is the, the need, uh, need more incentive for the gender advisor to stick with uh, gender e equality is, instead of uh, go, uh, go, going to all, all other um, uh, 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 pri uh, priority. And in terms of monitoring and evaluation, 
many past, um, past e e evaluation have shown that uh, uh, the, their focus was on was on on, on practical instead 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 of the stra 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 strategical needs of 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 women, and that's also uh, there is also the issue of gender uh, sensitive etiquette, but one pro uh, one. Uh, one a a a approach that was uh, that 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 we discussed during our interview, which is uh, most of the gender advisors said it, it, it was more effective, even than gender men uh, men 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 streaming in uh, in in the context of 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 changing and mobility and 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 the nature of 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 partnership is is a policy di di dialogue and that works very well with a budget sub a support because they are fun a financial a a a incentive and then uh, there are more um, during our uh, interview, we, we found out that CEDA was moving toward private sec uh, sector, and that uh, some, and that we will, uh, will be discussed in uh, in Lima's paper. Um, and they're also using more budget sup uh, support. And as a matter of fact, and neither have because the, uh, uh, at the time of the the, uh, the interview, they were uh, reviewing the, the strategies for gender equality. And, and they come up that they, uh, they were moving, they, uh, they started to decide that they, uh, they, uh, they will put more funding in, 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 in the global funds that's through budget uh, sub, uh, sub, uh, support. And also, uh, the fin uh, Finnish M M M MFA also have, um, a, 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 at the time of the, the, uh, the, the interview, that they also have decided to, to, uh, to give more support to women's pol uh, political net, uh, net, network. So what are the policy implications and con conclusion of, of the paper? Um, well, one of the, um, the, the, the policy application is incentive. I, I, incentive does not uh, matter for, for uh, making sure that the gender advisors are staying focused on, on, on issue of women and then gender men and men stream. But that also depends on, 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 on their level of commitment. For accountability, we, we did not find anything. We think that it's not only, only about incentive and commitment, but as well as accountability. What, what, what do you do needs to and to be uh, taken, care, uh, taken care of at, 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 at the end of the day? And the result agenda can is a is an opportunity to, 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 to maintain the focus on, on, on gender. Because there, there, uh, there has been talk uh, to, to, uh, to go away from gender men, uh, men, uh, men, 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 men streaming. And one, one, uh, one alternative, I think, is the uh, result, uh, result, uh, result agenda, but then we also need to, to make, uh, make uh, uh, have clear gender sensitive and, 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 and indicator and also link gender equality to all other development at 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 com. We also found out that. Um, because of the changing part partnership as well as the involvement of 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 of, of many actors 
in foreign aid, the development agency, they are not necessarily the starting point for a good gender mainstreaming investigation. Thank you. Joel, thank you very much. Um, Nilima Gulrajana, Gulrajani is going to be the third speaker. Uh, she's um, based at uh, Oxford University and uh, my old university, and I noticed that the university is now doing much more interesting things than when I was there. So, uh, Nilima, do you would like to speak from the podium? Uh, and uh, then the three speakers, presenters, will join me uh, here on the panel. We'll have some time for questions. Uh, a couple of the subjects, there was a nice link at the end of uh, Joel's paper, uh, with the private sector and global funds, foundations, there are many new actors uh, coming into the territory, not just the uh, donors, and I look forward to hearing about it. Thank you, Roger, um, and thank you, uh, UNU Wider, for the invitation. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, um, I realize I'm the last presentation between you and lunch, um, and the session's supposed to end at 12.15, so I'm going to try and be as brief as possible um, that's often quite hard for an academic, though. So I, I have my stopwatch here, so hopefully I won't go beyond the, the 12 minutes that, that I had. Um, I'm here today to talk about um, corporate actors um, and pretty much the linkage between um, public sector aid agencies and corporate actors through a new aid modality, and new, you might want to put in parentheses, um, challenge funds in particular. And um, I'm interested in the implications of these new funds for gender, specifically. So I had two motivating questions. Um, the first really was, what is this aid modality, and how are gender challenges integrated um, within the modality? So how are gender challenges in development mainstreamed within this relatively new aid modality that seeks to promote um, public-private partnership? Um, and secondly, really, was to try and address um, the implications for traditional aid actors or donors themselves. So how should they be steering their growing engagement um, with the corporate sector to achieve robust gender um, equality objectives? Um, basically, the argument here is that the rise of corporate actors in development has consequences for donors, for the way donors organize and manage themselves and also um, mainstream their gender um, objectives. Um, I should say here that this is very early days for um, analytical engagement on this question around challenge funds in particular. Um, the global fund is um, more widely studied, but um, probably doesn't fit the definition of a classic challenge fund either. So um, this is quite exploratory research um, at this stage. Um, just to briefly contextualize, um, some people have talked about a quiet corporate revolution in the world of aid. Um, private donors um, channel considerable sums of money to development, and uh, one estimate by the OECD claimed over 55 billion in 2012. Um, and an interesting paper by Rogerson and, and Karas, um, published by the ODI, um, suggested that private giving in aid is a major disruptor for the donor aid community. Um, and without aid ad adaptation, these aid agencies risk irrelevance. Um, arguably, in the second point, um, public sector and to some extent NGOs are playing a defensive game here. Um, they tend to be viewed as slow, bureaucratic, inefficient, largely supply driven, um, in contradistinction to the corporate sector that um, is agile, flexible, client centered. Um, and so donors themselves um, seem to be um, reacting to that, um, that sort of lack of um, credibility or that deteriorating situation of credibility by increasingly trying to partner with this sector. Um, just briefly, some of the, um, tracing the historical evolution of um, corporate actors in development, um, I sort of identify four periods in the paper. The first being um, sort of the traditional economic understanding of business as a tool for growth, um, wealth creation, employment creation, um, largely driven by trickle-down economics understandings and the positive externalities that um, a growing uh, business community has for growth rates um, and development as a consequence of that. Um, the second period seems to have evolved into more of a notion that corporates themselves 
potentially have negative, create negative externalities that need to be minimized by voluntary codes of conduct um, that can address uh, um, and mitigate those externalities, um, whether that be on human rights issues or environmental issues, for example. So here we had a more proactive engagement um, to enhance perhaps, uh, well, well actually we evolved from negative externality mitigation to something more proactively trying to enhance the positive externalities of business. And it's in that phase that I think we move to this third period of inclusive business, where here businesses are no longer simply um, tools for growth, but actually agents of development themselves. Um, and the term inclusive business has been talked about here, where poverty is defined or is, is seen as an opportunity um, for both businesses um, um, as well as for the poor. Um, and the paper sort of goes into more detail in terms of that, that phase and what that really means. But largely, um, the, the main point here is that there has been criticism of this phase, this inclusive business term, um, as basically the corporate sector exploiting um, the poor, um, trying to sell to the poor um, in such a way that they're encouraging sort of consumption of um, products that perhaps aren't as helpful for their needs or um, frankly, um, just just not appropriate for, for that for, for their needs. Um, again, the, the last phase, um, which we are talking about now, is social business or BOP, bottom of the pyramid 2.0, where here the poor are seen not as consumers of um, goods or services necessarily, but more actively um, as producers, as partners with corporates, um, very much involved in production networks. Um, and really the poor are seen as um, having opportunities to enhance their own capabilities in supply chains, for example. Um, and here, this space is increasingly talking about um, corporates potentially having to sacrifice profits to achieve development and social aims, whereas BOP 1.0 was very much about win-win situations. I think there's a sense in which BOP 2.0 recognizes there are potential trade-offs between um, commercial profitability and social impact. Defining challenge funds. Um, there are no clear definitions and they're largely driven by examples of challenge funds, but I think you can attribute certain characteristics to challenge funds. Um, and most importantly, this notion of partnership between these two communities. Um, importantly, though, often defined um, via third-party contractors. Um, so you find consultancy companies, PwCs and Accentures often brokering these partnerships. Um, and I put business mainly because there are challenge funds that do work with, with non-governmental organizations in particular, uh, but the vast majority do focus on the linkage between donors and business. Um, Another characteristic is the innovative potential um, that's possible. So there is a notion here that um, challenge funds um, stimulate innovation, thinking outside of the box um, in development, and they reduce the risk of the uncertainty when wanting to engage with in innovation in this space. The third characteristic is its ability to leverage additional investment. So often challenge funds are based on a premise that um, the, the, the business partner needs to provide match funding, often in a 50-50 ratio. Um, so it can encourage additional funds um, to the development intervention. And then lastly, although perhaps I should have put that first, it's a competitive process. Um, some are more competitive than others, as we'll see in the two cases I look at. Um, but the idea here is you, you select the best opportunities to, through some form of competitive um, mechanism. Um, and it, that, that means that there's also a clear exit strategy for the donors. There's no commitment necessarily to fund on a second round or a third round. I think what's important though is that the rationale for these challenge funds are twofold. One is a more instrumental rationale um, that donors can benefit from this kind of engagement by um, leveraging the expertise of corporates, um, by resource sharing, and by perhaps deflecting some of the competitive pressures that I mentioned exist in the donor community. Um, corporates can benefit. Um, they can provide, uh, they get access to some amount of patient capital. Cap ca patient capital that doesn't need a return in two years, um, sometimes at better, at better rate, so it's grant financing in many cases, in most cases. And also that corporates can benefit from donor networks um, in the markets that they're engaged with um, and their contacts through intermediaries, partners, NGOs working at that level and so on. Um, 
The normative rationale, however, is, is also really interesting um, and could perhaps be the su uh, subject of another study entirely. Um, my sense is that, th that this is inserting um, business thinking in the aid world, um, and that's sort of viewed to be a good thing, um, largely, and we can question that, I suppose. Um, and that um, it also legitimizes bus business as a caring um, actor in the space as well. So there are normative and instrumental benefits. And, and just briefly, they aren't necessarily new. So we've had prize funds that have existed in development, um, enterprise development funds. So some question as, as to its newness as well as a mechanism. Okay, um, the paper goes into these two examples, and I'm not gonna have a chance to, to get into very much detail on them. But the main difference is the, the one on the left, the business innovation facilities funded by DFID, um, Innovations Against Poverty, funded by Swedish CETA. Um, main differences between the two, the UK approach, the BIF, is very much technical assistance window. Um, they very, very much claim that, that they're not providing cash finance to business, that it's about um, choosing particular organizations that face very specific constraints, um, understanding of their market, for example, and financing a study or bringing in consultants to, to do some analysis for them. Um, Innovations Against Poverty is very much about a cash financing window for specific um, businesses. Um, the, the DFID example also is not as selective. Um, projects are solicited largely through the informal networks between country managers and um, the, the aid agency's employees. Um, CETA is a very transparent, competitive um, selection process. Geographic spoke, scope, the UK facility has defined itself in its pilot phase on five countries, um, and Swedish CETA has not, had had not defined a geographic scope. Um, so these are just some highlights um, of the, the window. Again, all these tables are in the paper, but you can see the UK example is focused largely on the five countries. The IAP has a much more wider geographic dispersion, dispersion um, but the IAP also provides less, um, pro, uh, less it funds less projects, um, mainly because they are providing cash finance, so larger spend per project as opposed to the UK model. Um, sectors that are financed predominantly agriculture, um, secondly, energy. Um, the other is a large category, mainly because they're either identified or cross-sectoral. Um, modes of involvement, so how are the poor involved in these projects? Um, interestingly, somewhat even across the producer-consumer dimension, less so as distributors, um, and the paper gets into the relative distribution between the IAP and BIF projects and why that might be the case. Uh, I won't go into that here. Um, but really for this audience, I suppose, it's, it's the intersections between this engagement with the corporate world um, and the intersection of that with, with gender that, that is interesting um, for you, I imagine, and for me. Um, I have a quote here from the OECD Mainstreaming Gender Equality Report, suggesting that it is difficult to, uh, and it's not surprising that these efforts to harmonize and promote gender-sensitive dialogue on a, new aid modalities is challenging. Um, and I think these this comparative case study, um, while early days for both initiatives suggest or is in support of that statement. Um, now I know Karen's comments initially were sort of questioning mainstreaming, um, suggesting it potentially invisibilizes um, gender. But the reality I think is that donors, as some of the other presentations earlier suggested, are committed to these cross-cutting horizontal um, initiatives and they often define gender as that. And so the paper is premised on the view that one, uh, donors are seeking to mainstream gender at the same time as they have these initiatives um, on, pri on the private sector side. So how do the two interact? And I study this in two dimensions. One is how do they select projects um, in both those um, challenge funds? And how do gender criteria come into the project selection phase? And then how do gender criteria input into the performance assessment of both those, um, of both those windows? And, um, so all donors find this challenging. That's very clear um, from the earlier presentations. Um, briefly, though, um, in the DFID and CETA case, what we see is um, this tension that was also identified um, by Karen between instrumental and rights-based approaches um, and evaluations and the current kind of work that's being done suggest as much that there are these tensions between these two dimensions. Um, so the results then of this sort of very exploratory research, how these gender criteria interact with challenge funds is in terms of the project selection, um, 
the BIF, the UK model, doesn't um, have clear eligibility criteria that um, look at gender. Um, as I said, it's not an open competition. It is proposals are solicited through an informal network kind of based approach. Um, by contrast, the Swedish approach does have clear eligibility criteria defined on the basis of gender. Um, in terms of the overall objectives and of gender objectives that, that are defined in the, in the challenge fund, um, the BIF um, doesn't really address that at all. Um, they define um, their objectives largely in terms of scale, and scale is defined largely in terms of reach. So um, directly being able to reach a poor person or indirectly being able to reach a poor person, whether female or male, is, is really an objective. Um, and the focus for the, for the BIF is largely on the operational constraints of business themselves. So what they're looking, are specific looking for are specific obstacles um, that these businesses are facing um, that are preventing their commercial growth. And that is the, the large driver for selecting um, these companies. Um, on the IAP side, what's interesting is there are um, sort of very specific gender objectives that are defined on both the output and outcome levels. And also, more, more interestingly perhaps, is the interest in systematic effects, um, or systemic effects, sorry. So um, how is the wider structural constraints um, on gender actually addressed through this particular project, um, which was very interesting to see. I didn't expect that. Um, types of businesses targeted. So the BIF very much sits within the BOP 1.0 phase where we're looking at you know, corporate Corporates who have strong commercial drivers um, and their development goals are, I would say, secondary. Some might dispute that, but in the basis of the portfolio analysis, I think the development sits very much secondarily to the commercial viability of the ventures. Um, in contrast to the IAP, which does seem to seek out um, businesses more aligned with the second phase of um, bottom of the pyramid approaches. In terms of performance assessment, um, looking at the contributions to development and how um, we, these initiatives define development additionality um, within the UK context, there doesn't seem to be any focus on gender within that, um, that space. Uh, the IAP neither, but you might argue that the IAP has stronger criteria on the selection phase such that the potential additionality that's achieved um, in terms of performance assessment um, could potentially be far greater. I should say that performance assessment on both these initiatives is still ongoing. Um, there has been no major evaluation of either of these initiatives to date. The BIF pilot has just finished, so um, I have to caveat all this with these are still early days for, for both these initiatives. Um, on the metrics, again, largely quantitatively based in the BIF, indicator based. Just to give you an example, the BIF funding window is only 3.1 million pounds. Um, the BIF claims that 1.9 million people are reached. And so when I asked what does reach really mean as well, they potentially bought a product, for example, that was being funded by this initiative. So it's, it's very yeah, indicator based and very much defined on that level of scale, really. Um, the, yes. Yeah, okay, yes, okay. Um, so that, that's basically the news headlines. You can read more about, about this, I suppose, but um, it's early days for it. Um, last slide, uh, policy recommendations for donors. So going back to my second question, uh, within challenge funds, how should donors steer their engagement to achieve um, gender results given this new window? And I think one needs to think very carefully about the comparative advantages of donors and corporates. Um, so should corporates be doing development? Should donors be outsourcing this element of the development work to corporates? Um, why are challenge funds advantageous as a mechanism um, for achieving this type of development goal? So thinking through carefully the comparative advantages of these two groups. Um, are we potentially de-skilling donor agencies by outsourcing this kind of work to corporates. Um, so that there are a whole a host of questions that are raised there. Um, I think there's also um, a sense in which we need to be clear and ambitious with our gender objectives within the project selection phase specifically, so we can develop baseline indicators that can then be used throughout the project cycle to eventually as assess impact. Um, there are implications for who the businesses um, that we partner with are. Um, it seems that if you, have, uh, if you engage with businesses that are more ambitious on the development front, one is likely to um, achieve higher performance on gender goals, although, you know, obviously these are all caveated. Um, 
you might want to also think about how you integrate and ensure consistency across these cross-cutting horizontal issues of private sector development and, and gender. Um, you want to engage corporate actors more proactively on gender, so including on the performance assessment phase. So for many corporates, the monitoring and evaluation on the development side was really um, seen to be more of a burden than anything else. Um, their, their imperative was really on the corporate, on the profitability uh, of their commercial venture. And then the role of third party implementers. Interestingly, in, in both these initiatives, it's PwC who are the third party contractors here. Um, what kind of M&E work are they doing? What's their role? Um, question whether you know, their focus as a consulting company is largely on the commercial concerns of business. <laughs> so how do they um, sit there in the, at the interface between uh, the donors and, and business? Um, and that's the full reference for the paper, if you're interested. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Uh, come and join us. And uh, Jenny, if you could come and join us. I've got a special dispensation from Finn to take three or four questions and pinch a little of the lunch break. And thank you very much for registering. If we could have a microphone over here, please. Uh, perhaps two more people who wish to address a question, identify yourselves. Uh, Karen here. And yes, I don't know you yet, but we will take you as well. Thank you. Please. Thank you. My name is Tarja Repon, and I am Ambassador for Gender and Equality in Finland. A couple of questions to all of the presentations, which were very interesting. First of all, to Mrs. McGill. I just wonder, why did you omit handling China and India in this respective uh, because in my view, you confused a little bit of different aid agencies and the International Institute. It's quite valid, of course, to talk about what Australians and Japanese and a couple of others are doing in their donor activities. But uh, in my view, Asian Development Bank is very much international institute. Finland is member of that, and we are very well aware of their gender um, uh, uh, programs and we act uh, supporting gender issues to be widely taken up in Asian Development Bank. So I think it is uh, it's a bit misleading uh, conceptually if you analyze all of them. But the question of China, what do you say about that? Uh, because uh, China, uh, of course, as we all know, is a problem in many ways. But uh, according to our experience, they have now shown a lot of interest into gender questions in, on policy level, and uh, all in all, they pretend to be a donor as well. They just have this dual approach of being uh, leading country of development world when it's profitable for them for policy reasons. And my second... Uh, if we want to hear the answers to the questions, the questions have to be short, please. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Sorry. The Thank second you. one is, of course, a shorter one uh, when it concerns the Nordic donors, where did you forget uh, Icelandic? Because they are members of uh, DAC and they are very, how should I say, um, operative also in the aid issues, even though they have small population. The picture which you gave about Finland is a bit misleading because fin in Finland development issues are part of our foreign policy and uh, therefore uh, development agencies, there is no special agency, uh, but these issues are dealt in the foreign ministry, which is again uh, trying to implement the policy of the government on gender issues. So I would say that number of gender advisors who is here doesn't uh, matter because she's extremely qualified. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much. Uh, Karen, uh, short and sweet, please. Yeah. Thank you to everybody. Very interesting presentations. This is a question for Ninema. Um, I think it's a very, this is a very interesting paper. Um, I think that part of the, one of the issues that I think is interesting is the question of, um, the, the tension does exist between rights-based and this instrumentalism. But one of the things that I think has been attention and is interesting in this, in this space is whether you can get results with the private sector entry in ways that you can't get results, and whether the progress would be faster because of that, because they're nimble and so forth. But it raises all kinds of tensions there because the questions of all the, the way that you do that and whether these interventions are rights-respecting is where I think some of the issues are. 
I have a second more interesting question for me, maybe not for you. And this is meant to be very friendly, not hostile. Uh, but what does gender criteria mean? I, I don't know what that means. And uh, you know, well, this is one of the questions when I moved to AID from academic life and I would see gender considerations and gender criteria. I don't think that's very helpful. I think the question is, when you say, what, are there gender criteria as part of selection or as part of the objectives? I think it's more helpful to reframe this in the sense of, when you're talking about women or women-owned businesses, you need to say that. But if you're talking about, and you're talking about the profitability or earnings of women-owned businesses, but what, is a gender criteria doing something like changing the sex seg segregation of firms across industries? Is it doing something else? So I, I really think this is an example for this community of how we might start to think about doing business differently. First, by starting with our language. If you could pass it to your neighbour, and please introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm Lucia Hanma, I'm from the World Bank, and I have a question for Nilima as well, which is, uh, did you think about um, framing your work in terms of looking at quotas? It seems more of a, in terms of looking at quotas, and I think it slightly picks up on um, Karen's last point. So that the selection is either in terms of a quota of number of firms which are women owned or in the sectors which employ women, that would seem to have much more traction when you're dealing with private sector um, kinds of um, and, uh, you know, activities. Mm -hmm. Okay, my instructions to the panel, pretend you're politicians, just answer the questions you like. Uh, Nilima. <laughs> 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 no, 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 but, Sorry, can we have the microphone, please? Okay. Um, I think the first point was, was more a comment, so I'm not going to address, address that, but the second question about what gender criteria means. Um, and I think perhaps the best way to, to address that is through an example of what I mean by it, um, because it isn't defined very clearly even in the documentation that I had access to. So... Um, there was one business financed by um, the IAP, for example, which was um, distributing or, or trying to get um, teenage girls, gave them access to reusable um, sanitary products. So Ruby Cup was the project. Um, and the argument there is if you could make, um, get access um, to those girls of this product, you would reduce infection rates because often um, teenage girls were using um, cotton that was dirty or not changing frequently and so on. Um, and so the, the, I spoke to the owner of that particular, the, the, the founder of that particular initiative, and it seemed clear that, that the criteria by which she was selected didn't have necessarily how many women were affected, but very much driven by a notion that this could potentially be life-changing in terms of attendance to school at school, for example, um, in terms of not having to sell sexual favors to have access is to buy disposable sanitary hygiene products. So, and, and the IEP seemed to have um, caught on to that kind of more systemic potential impact of that particular project. Um, I, I would love to reframe it along the lines that you suggested. The data isn't there at this point, but, but I, we could have a conversation about how one might get to that data. And I guess it's related to, to that point that the, the data isn't there just yet. Um, it's, you know, quotas, yes, could be potentially a very interesting way to look at it. Number of uh, firms owned by women, sectors employing women, but the, the donor agencies don't disaggregate project finance on the basis of, of that information, and I didn't have the ability to go in, in its exploratory research, so, but it's an interesting potential next stage for this. Okay, Jenny, you left out India and China, how could you? That was really unfair of me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, so thank you very much for the question. Um, on why I included um, Asian Development Bank, um, selfishly I was very familiar with their practices, I'd worked there, so I must be very, must confess that up front, but I also thought that some of ADB's recent achievements in terms of gender mainstreaming, in, in, especially in economic sectors, also held valuable lessons, especially for, for bilateral donors such as um, Japan and, and Korea, which also provide most of their donor development assistance through loans. And I think that common aid modality was a useful excuse for um, including, uh, admittedly, an international organization. So um, I agree, I did muddle and, and stretch the definition a bit. Um, as to why I didn't include India and China, it was really a matter of time. Um, the 
awareness that just getting data um, on the, the, the practice of those organizations would be more challenging. But it's definitely um, something that I'm interested in exploring further. But I think it, then it would be useful to look more broadly at Asian developing countries, um, because I think historically countries such as Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand have been providing South-South cooperation support to other developing countries on gender equality issues. So I, I think I would want to broaden it and not just look at the, the big players, um, but more broadly at the role that um, um, developing countries have been playing um, on gender equality, both domestically and in supporting others. So, and Joel, you left out Iceland and you need to make friends with the Finns over lunch. <laughs> and I left out uh, uh, also Norway. I, I, I was expecting this question from some, uh, somebody from Norway to come and say, why did you leave us out? So the, uh, the easy answer to that it was just that I, I had uh, a, a, an opportunity with Dan Ed, I need that, see that and finish. So it was just a, a, a matter of, of where do I, do I have people to uh, to, uh, to talk to? Or where, uh, where areas for Norred, I, I, I needed to find out first the people to meet them and so on. But with that, uh, I need that and see that and finish. Uh, the, uh, as, a, uh, as a matter of fact, for the Finnish uh, interview, we, we have invited them for a coffee break, basically. So it was during the, the, the coffee break that we could talk because we are just close to e e each other. So mea culpa for, uh, for that, and mea culpa to Nor uh, Norway too. And in, in terms of the finish uh, that my paper is, is, is misleading, I do not think that my paper is, is misleading because we have referred to the fact that the Finnish MFA is not a, a, a development agency per se. So I'm, I, I did not have the chance to, to, to say it here, but in, uh, but, uh, but, but in the paper, we, are, we, we have talked about the, 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 the structure. And in terms of, uh, first of all, my, uh, my paper is not a, an assessment on the effectiveness of, of those three agencies. It has nothing to do with uh, what PIVI does or doesn't do. So I can, I, 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 will, res, I, I, I will reserve my comment for, uh, for that. It's not a, a, an assessment to their effectiveness. It's just a way to, to show what they, they, uh, they have done and how they are diff, uh, diff, uh, di, uh, different or similar. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So you can see the panel of perfect researchers more research needs to be done. It's always the answer with researchers. Uh, thank you all very much for showing us uh, your work in progress. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I'd also like to do two more things. A book review, which is feminists in development organizations. If you want to survive as a woman in a development organization, you need to read this book. It's fantastic on how to be effective uh, in these agendas. It's uh, by Rosalind Ibin and Laura Turke. I'll put it, I'll make sure it goes in, the, the reference goes in the report. It's Feminists in Development Organizations Change from the Margins. So I strongly recommend that. That was my homework before coming here. And now, before lunch, you're going to be animated. And um, I've also got to tell you that lunch is downstairs at reception where you came in. So, please animate us. In RECOM, UNUWIDA's global network of researchers compile and assess the best evidence on the impact of foreign aid. Here we take a closer look at how aid works to promote gender equality and women's empowerment. Over the last decade, most donors have made strong commitments to improving the lives of women and girls. These commitments have translated into a four-fold increase in foreign aid toward gender equality and women's empowerment, increasing from 6.5 billion US dollars in 2002 to 25.5 billion dollars in 2011. A substantial part of this aid has been directed to the education and health sectors. For instance, 
education and health receive more than half of the total bilateral aid, whereas by contrast, the agriculture and rural development sectors have received one-fifth of the total aid allocated to support economic and productive sectors. There are encouraging signs that foreign aid has reduced gender inequality and benefited women and girls. An increase in foreign aid is associated with an improvement in both the human development and the gender inequality indexes. Specifically, aid appears to be effective in reducing maternal deaths, as well as helping to close the gender gap in youth literacy. Larger amounts of aid is given to countries that grant more extensive rights to women. Increased aid to women's organisations has had a positive effect on women's political empowerment in the Middle East and in North Africa. Furthermore, initiatives that use an economic entry point to empower women have spillover effects, improving women's self-confidence and decision-making, as well as increasing household income. Foreign aid has been a catalyst in improving gender equality, but it has not done so alone. Women themselves have actively organised to ensure their rights are respected, their voices are heard in decision-making bodies, their bargaining power both at home and in local communities is boosted, and their participation in economic life is amplified. Some partner countries have passed legislation to help remove constraints to women's participation in labour and credit markets, and to make divorce and inheritance laws far more gender equitable. Still, more needs to be done to end violence against women and girls, and to improve women's asset ownership and access to credit, together with their participation in paid employment and politics, and, importantly, to improve men's contribution to childcare and domestic work. UNUIDA researchers from all over the world have come together to find out what works, what could work, what is scalable, and what is transferable in foreign aid. To learn more, come visit our website at wecomp.wider.unu.edu.